Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Reserved Investments and thank you for joining me. Today, we're going to have a candid conversation on understanding value as it relates to the antiques and collectibles trade. An exciting talking point, I know, but something where if you actually watch this video, I assure you, you will get something out of it because I know this video isn't going to do well in regards to the YouTube algorithm. But this is a conversation that we need to have because there's a lot of people out there that do not understand how value works in the overall antiques and collectibles trade. And if you turn on any of those wonderful reality-based collecting shows like Antiques Roadshow, American Pickers, Pawn Stars, Storage Wars, it's all about the Benjamins, baby. Everybody wants to know what their item is worth. Well, let me give you the short answer so you don't have to stick around and watch the whole video if you don't want to. The short answer is value in the antiques and collectibles trade is simply based on whatever somebody is willing to pay for a particular item at that particular point in time that the person is selling the item at. So that's really what value is based on. It is an abstract concept. This is what makes investing or speculating on these items, whether it's over the short term or if we're talking about investing over the long term, inherently risky. There are no underlying cash flows. The fundamentals are all fugazi. These markets are completely abstract. They are not logical. When we look at assets like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, and the like, there are logical, hardcore financial fundamentals that make up the value of those assets. Now, is there some abstract that belongs in that mix as well? Obviously, today's price point for the S&P 500 index is different than yesterday's, which is going to be different than tomorrow's. The assets allowed to fluctuate and float in value. But overall, it's more logical than that of a rare coin than that of an antique Chinese vase. Sorry, I can't say vase. I'm an expert in the antiques and collectibles trade. And once you become an expert in these markets, you have to use the term vase. You're no longer allowed to say vase. Otherwise, they come and take your credentials away. On the other end of the trade, when we talk about collectibles like Pokemon cards, whether we're talking about comic books or vintage toys or even Pez dispensers, those particular items are completely abstract as well. The way that we value these objects comes down to a set system of what these items are selling for at any given time. And we assess an estimated value to them. And some of you get caught up in this fake assessed value in your head because you simply seen a similar item sell for a record price without understanding that that wasn't your item that sold for that record price. That was a point in time that may or may not be replicated again at some point in the future. So if you look and you see that record price is being sold for an item that you have, if you go and sell your item, you may not be able to replicate the outcome of that scenario where that particular same item sold for X number of dollars. This is what you need to understand. It's all subjective. It's all fugazi. It is all speculative in nature. Now, where am I going with this? Well, there's a couple of tips that I can give you to navigate this market. Because in the year 2024, it's all about the Benjamins. And it's getting worse. With all this hype-driven content on YouTube, whether it's geared towards video games, comic books, Pokemon cards, rare coins, traditional antiques, artwork, whatever it is, there's a lot of money moving in and out of these markets at any given time. And what makes this even more complex, all these markets that we love, whether it's, again, comic books, Pokemon cards, rare coins, whatever it is, all these markets are always evolving and changing right before our eyes. Now, some of these markets evolve a lot quicker than others. Everybody remember the great video game bubble? Remember the massive price increase in great video games simply because a new grading company came on the scene. And Sean here with Reserved Investments told you guys, don't buy into the hype. You're going to be sorry. And what happened? Well, over a few short years, that market crashed. In some cases, up to 80%, meaning people lost 80% of the money they put in that market because they didn't understand the risks. They didn't understand how value works 
in the overall antiques and collectibles trade. And this fits right in with some of my other talking points that tell you guys, if you have these items and a market pops, a market starts going crazy, it starts going into the stratosphere, prices increase, you should sell into the hype. There's no formula I can give you that is going to help you value an antique and collectible at some point in the future. It's whatever somebody is willing to pay for it. This is what a lot of the Timmy's, Kimmy's, and Poindexter's do not understand. The actual core fundamental of investing in the antiques and collectibles trade is that there are no core fundamentals that can dictate what somebody is willing to pay for an item. X number of months, X number of years, or X number of decades in the future going forward. Now, this is very important because there's a lot of interesting theories that go into this. And in 1988, literary critic Barbara Hernstein Smith penned a book entitled The Contingencies of Value. This was a groundbreaking book. Now, spoiler alert, for those of you that love the book recommendations that I give on this channel, please do not run to eBay and Amazon and order yourself a used copy of this book. It is no longer in print, but it is not about the antiques and collectibles trade. The antiques and collectibles trade is simply mentioned in passing, or I should say in the abstract, because this is a book that is written about the value of things, how we value things as a culture, as a society, within our economic system. And I want to give credit to the author. The author, Barbara Hernstein Smith, did an excellent job writing this book. A lot of you guys, if you would order this book, you would be bored reading it. It really goes in depth. It really goes into the abstract talking about this core point. And remember, once again, I got to stress this, it is not written directly about the antiques and collectibles trade. Now, in this particular book, the author makes a point that Value is a direct product of an economic system, which is 100% correct. If you take away the economic system, the value of any item really doesn't matter when we look at it from that perspective. Again, we're looking at this from outside the matrix looking in, if you get that analogy. Now, in this particular book entitled The Contingencies of Value, the author also presents a relative theory of value contending that value emerges from a dynamic process of changing and interacting variables. Now, that's just the fancy way of saying the only constant is change. Value is not fixed. If you want proof, if we get in my DeLorean time machine and we go back to the 1980s and we go and we seek out experts in the antiques and collectibles trade, Every prominent expert in the antiques and collectibles trade back then would tell you, hey, if you want to buy a yearly price guide, because remember, back then there was no internet. Back then, we didn't get real live auction data. So if you were going to go to your local Walden Books, did I trigger anyone? B. Dalton Booksellers, and you were going to get a copy of the 1989 Warman's or Antique Trader Price Guide, if those books were even published back then. I know Cobbles was, so I should have went with Cobbles. Cobbles definitely was published in the 1980s. And you were going to read through it, and you were going to get pricing data. I really hate to tell you, the minute that particular price guide was published, all that data was already obsolete. Because pricing data in the antiques and collectibles trade is constantly evolving and changing. This is very important because when we look at these markets, we also have to divvy up the antique side of the trade, which is in parallel but contrast to the collectible side of the trade. And the reason why I'm bringing this up, the antique trade is governed by historical significance. The collectible side of the trade is governed by cultural relevance. And this is something that a lot of people do not understand. You know, just recently, a copy of Action Comics 1, first appearance of Superman from 1938. It was graded by CGC, and the book was in 8.5 condition, very fine plus condition. It sold through Heritage Auctions for $6 million. Now, if we get in my DeLorean time machine, and we go 500 years into the future, 
if Superman is no longer relevant, if nobody knows who Superman is, I hate to tell you, that copy of Action Comics 1 that just sold for $6 million is worthless 500 years from now, if that's the case. Cultural relevance is everything when we attempt to value these items. This is what the Pokemon community gets wrong. This is what the great video game community got wrong. They think simply because something is popular now and selling for a premium, as we go further out, that particular item is going to become more valuable. When in most cases, when we look at the antiques and collectibles trade, when we look at the history of the antiques and collectibles trade, unless that item has a lot of historical significance, meaning it becomes a highly sought after antique, a lot of these items, the further we go out, actually start to lose value. They do not become worth more money over time. And this is really important because if you ask somebody who understands the antiques and collectibles trade, who also understands the market for antiquities, who also understands the art market to give you his analysis on a lot of these pop culture collecting markets, he's going to look at these markets from a different perspective than the average Timmy Kimmy or Poindexter that grew up in the 1990s, remembers Pokemon, and thinks Pokemon is always going to be with us. Let me put this in terms that any of you can relate to. Did you ever watch the movie A Christmas Story? A Christmas Story is one of my favorite holiday films. And it came out in 1983, and it talks about a young Ralphie who's growing up in the 1930s in the United States. And all he wants for Christmas is a Daisy Red Rider BB gun. In the year 2024, is a Daisy BB gun culturally significant? The answer is no. Yet for those of you that collect comic books, if you remember, I'm sure some of you have these type of comic books in your collection. There are comic books, key vintage comic books from the 1970s, where on the back cover was a full page ad advertising a Daisy BB gun. Back in even the 1960s, the 1970s, Daisy BB guns were still culturally relevant. Today in the year 2024, they are not. So if you grew up in the 1930s and you came of age in the 1940s, 1950s, you raised your own family, you probably thought, well, Daisy is still in business. They're still putting full page ads out there on the back of a lot of these comic books that are very popular. Because remember, comic books were very, very popular in the 1960s and 70s, especially in America. A lot of younger kids were reading comic books on a consistent basis, even more than they are today. They would see that Daisy ad, and guess what? That particular item still had cultural relevance. In the year 2024, it does not. And I hate to say this, that's what's also going to happen to a lot of our beloved comic books. And if you want to cut me up in the comment section below, feel free. But please know, I am also a comic book collector and investor. But I also understand how these markets work. If you also go back and you watch the movie A Christmas Story, you're going to come across other culturally relevant terms that are no longer in existence today. For instance, who knows who Little Orphan Annie is? Does anybody remember drinking Ovaltine? A lot of you out there probably don't even know what Ovaltine is. These are all key terms and items that make up this movie that are no longer culturally relevant in the year 2024. It's just how we've evolved as a society. So when we look at markets, you need to understand that any market that makes up the antiques and collectibles trade from a financial perspective is abstract in nature. And this is very important. I can even prove this to you with examples. If we look at the collectible card game genre, a lot of you guys come screaming at me, Pokemon's everything. Sean, I love Magic the Gathering. Sean, you know, I'm not really in the Magic the Gathering or Pokemon. I understand it's the lesser popular card game at present time, but I'm into Yu-Gi-Oh. Okay, well, what about MetaZoo? Well, Sean, MetaZoo went belly up. Now you're starting to understand how cultural relevance is everything. This is why if we go back on this channel when I first started out, 
MetaZoo was coming into vogue. And I told you guys, it's being propped up by all these YouTube influencers. They're coming into this market. They're telling you to put your money in MetaZoo. It's going to go to zero if MetaZoo becomes worthless. Well, what happened a couple of years later? MetaZoo went bankrupt. MetaZoo became worthless. And now those wonderful booster boxes that people were paying thousands for can be seen selling on eBay, if they even sell, for less than 10% of their high market value. So a lot of these investors lost a ton of money. Now look at Pokemon. Pokemon's still going strong, but the prices have receded since the pandemic. Let's be realistic. There was a time, if you watch Rudy with Alpha Investments, the infamous Pokemon bathroom video, where a lot of his Pokemon holdings went down in value to the point that he threw them in a bathroom and didn't even want to even acknowledge that they existed. Then what happened? We were all stuck indoors due to the pandemic. Prices started skyrocketing for Pokemon cards. And now those particular items became worth money. Now that is the key difference between a property like Pokemon and that of MetaZoo. MetaZoo went to zero. Pokemon most likely will not go to zero. It will literally take decades, possibly hundreds of years or more for Pokemon to go to zero. But make no mistake, the market will evolve. The market will change. And it will be up to younger generations that are born well into the future to decide if they want to still collect or covet vintage Pokemon cards. Another example I can give you, look at the difference between Nintendo and Atari. Atari came on the scene late 70s. Everybody thought they were going to be a long-term player in the video game market or even the computer market because when they came on the scene, they made video game consoles and they made state-of-the-art computers at the time. Well, what happened? 1983, the great video game crash came upon us and Atari, unfortunately, entered a downturn. And they were sold to Time Warner. Time Warner didn't know what the hell they were doing. The company just about went bankrupt and was bought several times. Today, the company exists, but it's no longer as great as it once was when Nolan Bushnell created it. We all know the video game market pretty much belongs to Nintendo and Sony, maybe Microsoft. But they're the big boys now. Not Atari, not ColecoVision, which also went bankrupt. Not even Mattel and Television. Mattel exited the complete electronic video game marketplace after the Aquarius and Intellivision systems pretty much failed due to the video game crash. So this is where we are in the year 2024. Nintendo matters. Pokemon matters. MetaZoo doesn't. Atari doesn't. So how did we get here? All these markets change and evolve. So when somebody asks you what an item is worth, tell them the truth. It's worth what somebody is willing to pay for it at the particular point in time that it becomes available for sale. Nothing more, nothing less. These markets are abstract. They are not logical. Want further proof? A lot of you guys are going to cut me up in the comment section below for picking on great at video games or Pokemon. The reason why that you're so triggered is because you have an emotional attachment to these items. That is not logical. That is abstract, my friends. You're actually proving my point. Thank you for watching and have a great night.